All right, hello everybody. Today in the shop we have a gent who brought us a Strobocon from a good drive here. He probably had a few hour drive to bring it to us, but we have a Strobocon. As six, it's a 6T something. Um, obviously normally they stamp these as 6T5 or 6T3 uh, or something, but uh, there's no stamp and there's no serial number on this faceplate, so I think that might be a replacement faceplate. It's my only guess. The other thing that's unusual is it lists CG Con being in Oak Brook, Illinois, uh, where I'm used to it being Elkhart, Indiana. Well, anyway, let's uh, kick the tires and light the fires here, and I'll show you what it's doing. We turn it on on the warm-up mode, and it does look like a few of the knobs are like not original, like the lower tuning knob there looks looks different, um, and the upper knob on the volume control looks different, but that could just be a year-to-year -year difference. But obviously when we hit it, it's spinning, the wheels are spinning and turning and doing what wheels do. But within a good period of, say, 10 to 15 to 20 seconds, we should get our orange ready-to-go pilot light kicking on here, uh, indicating that the tuning fork down below has warmed up, is oscillating, and is supplying the appropriate signal to make the motor spin at the frequency it's supposed to with the 55 hertz tone as generated by the Strobocon. If you don't understand what the hell I'm talking about, it's okay. We'll, we'll deal with it. So if I were to switch it over to motor run, it just dies because the tuning fork assembly down there is not supplying the appropriate power. So we need to get in there and see why. Okay, so let's talk about this for a minute because the unit's actually working, kind of. Um, I have the scanner unit over on this side of the bench. So, it's working, but the pilot light down here is fizzing. It's definitely getting low power. Um, but, okay, I tested the tubes. Our 5U4 rectifier, which is your AC to DC, is weak. The 6V6s are okay. You know, on the orange, they're 6 and 7. New tubes are 8 and 9, but they're okay. The 6SN7, which I had to test on the ICO, tests okay. And the 6SC7 tests as weak. When I first initially fired this device up, um, it, I did not get a pilot light, the tuning fork at the front. Let me actually just walk around so you all know what I'm talking about, because if you all don't know what these are, then you don't know what, I'm, what we're even doing. Hopefully you've seen them on my other channel, or on other videos on my channel. So here's that, okay, and this right under here this is a tuning fork and it is actually singing at about 55 Hertz and there's an exciter coil and two pickup coils on this that are used to create 55 Hertz AC to run the motor okay so with the tuning fork or when I fired the unit up the tuning fork was not really starting on its own so I bumped it just a touch, just tapped it with the tip of my plastic screwdriver and it got going and now it is going and the unit is operable but you can tell it's just weak. It's like the tuning fork just doesn't keep running. And there's a little bit of adjustment. Now I just stopped the motor. I just touched the tuning fork and the whole motor just stopped. And it's trying to get going again. But it's just not getting enough gusto. So my theory is that we have, you know, either our driving tubes are weak, but that 5U4 is our main DC source. And I have one, I have a 5U4 that's better. It's not super, but it's better. So I'm going to first try to change the 5U4 and see if we get better uh, behavior. Uh, plus this thing is really, really, really dirty and it needs to be cleaned. 
Okay, so in replacing the very tired 5U4 rectifier with a moderately tired 5U4 rectifier, the device was at least able to start on its own. It is still under voltaging and choking. There is a little bit of a kind of a drive adjust mech that's on the side there. Um, but we really don't have super strong tubes and I'm fairly certain that our not so smooth drive tubes is uh, not helping us. So we have you know very old capacitors, very old tubes and a lot of dirt. So to really get this running properly we probably are going to be doing uh, as much surgery as I did on my SR6 T5 um, cap job and replaced all tubes that were tired. All right. Okay, so we're on to day two, and we've got all the screws out of this. I've had both of these opened up. Um, there are 13 tubes between the two units, and there is about only one tube that I would consider good enough to reuse, and it's one of the <laughs> 6v6s. The one that was its mate in this upper deck here was labeled a shot. Uh, none of the tubes in this match, you know, um, dude had probably just swapped a tube as needed. I, I mean, from what I understand, this was used professionally for piano tuning, so uh, the, probably quite a few hours on it. I mean, obviously the motor runs quiet and everything. It should still be able to be, you know, a good, healthy, serviceable unit. What was broken here is on these, there is a slide bar here, and it will change. I have no idea if I have enough light to see this. Eh, probably not. Well, just imagine. You can see. <laughs> no, you can't. I can see. Let's put the light down. Oh, there we go. Let's get the light down there. Does that help? Maybe. Okay, you can see the notes. Over here, this is your key. So if you're in the key of C, then you have, you know, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, F sharp, G, Da, da 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 down the line and you can slide this out with this peg well you can't see the peg the peg over here factory there was a peg there in this case there was no peg it was gone and the bracket that attaches the um, chart to the slider was gone and um, I can't exactly just put in a phone call and a new one appears so I fabricated a pull and this from some stuff I got at a home improvement store. Um, this is part of a, it's just in the specialty um, screws thing. It's like one of those, what do they call them, a city screw? Uh, like we use on the horse halters, that's part of that, a, a big one um, made of aluminium. The original one was chromed steel. but. Um, and then taking some threaded rod and uh, another piece of like a city city screw and converting that into almost a flat washer with threads because it's got to fit very narrowly and this push pull can't rub up against the spinners and the spinners I mean phew, there's very there's minimal clearance so uh, it's it's it was a challenge but I think we got that part so as of tomorrow afternoon, I should have all of the capacitors to redo this. We are going to be doing new tubes and new capacitors uh, throughout, which is great. And uh, <clears throat> in the meantime, I will start. I'm, we're going to be using the yellow tubular capacitors for the film. Um, just because of their dimensions, they're going to be easier to put in there than the red film capacitors. And then we have new electrolytics. We're going to try to uh, fit electrolytic capacitors beneath the chassis rather than uh, trying to replace the giant cans, which are uh, in short supply nowadays. So we'll get going on this, and uh, we'll see you as we just go through and change capacitors. Okay, so looking through my stash of yellow tubular capacitors, I don't have a whole lot of values in those. I got most really, mostly the red ones, which of course don't fit quite as well. And the way in this is point to point, the yellow tubulars just fit better. 
The new ones are a little bit smaller. That's the old red, big red .22. These were TRW capacitors. Um, so we changed two .1s and the .22 tonight. Um, we're going to get to the electrolytics tomorrow. I'm going to have to do some kind of terminal strip and figure out how to fit them in here. Um, the 40 microfarad ones over here still look alive, but this 22 is puking out black tar, um, so it looks like it wants to die. Um, so it's good that we're in here doing that. There's also a .047 that's like really snaked under here, so that one's going to be fun um, to get out. But So we've got just one more um, film cap and two, four, five electrolytics, and then we can officially say that we've recapped the scanner units circuit. Um, and then we'll move on to the what they call the tuner unit or the driving unit. Okay, so we're back another day here and uh, parts came in today on schedule. Thank you, um, vendor. C distribution. We all know who they are. If you work on amps, you know who they are. Um, 0.047 is in. The 50 microfarad electrolytic is in. And now I got to deal with these electrolytics, the big boys here. And uh, I could either, you know, follow the traces here and see where these go and uh, and then the other end goes to earth you know um, we could do that or I could put a terminal strip in and I'm going to decide what the best uh, course of action for that is and then I'll get back to you okay well that was a bit of an adventure um, these this these two were originally 20 microfarad um, and the circuit and they went to this point and this point respectively and they were grounded you know here at the tail of the ground bus so I was able to ground these two filter caps these are 22 microfarad which is the closest value we have in normal you know readily available values unless we're gonna go try to you know hunt down some magic sprigs or something um, so that's fine. Um, we need to make sure that I obviously don't cross any wires that weren't supposed to be crossed, so we're going to double check that. But uh, got those two in, and then for the 47s, one of them came down to this point here, and there's a ground that comes from here and snakes around right to about here. So I was able to pick up the ground here, and I grounded this cap here, which the other end, this 40, goes here. And of course 40 is again another one of those kind of obsolete values, so the closest we have is 47. These are 450 volt capacitors, which is what was originally spec'd for. I'm kind of glad that I didn't try to boost it to 500, because if I tried to boost it to 500, good grief, we would be in tight spaces. But uh, yeah, there's a couple of these like, you know, earth wires here, you know, that we really do need to be conscious of and be careful that you know in any time we stick things between other things we need to make sure we don't have anything touching that you know shouldn't be touching because when we put power to it very bad things can happen um, but I think we're cool and uh, that actually will complete the circuitry with the scanning unit we can put that back together and put some fresh tubes in it okay so here we are back at our adventure We've reassembled the scanner unit's chassis into the main unit here, um, and we have the 6J7. 6J7 is a new old stock RCA. Um, the wire for the top cap popped off the clip, just broke um, when I picked it up, so we trimmed and resoldered that so that's okay and then this this top this cover is like a shield to ground um, to help keep noise off of that because the grid the input of this tube is on top um, and we have a 6SC7 new old stock Raytheon 
Um, I actually got the last two 6SC7s in the whole store. Lucky me. Uh, and then our tubes here are 6V6GTs, current production, and our 5Y3 rectifier is uh, TAD, current production. So um, that's all good. Now we will set the scanning unit down. We're going to leave it open because we still need to oil it and we want to make sure everything is good before we put it back together. Um, by the way, this top of this transformer here is the transformer output. That's the output for the um, neon bulb flashers. So um, it's very important to make sure that this wire doesn't have any you know, cuts or slices or anything in it because this carries a stupid amount of voltage and uh, you could really get hurt by uh, licking that. So don't do that, okay? On to the tuning unit. Okay, so we're looking at the underside of the tuning unit. I'm not sure how I'm going to lay this to solder on it, but um, I think these were made at different times, and it's very, you know, possible that, you know, they just produced tuning units and um, scanning units in separate areas of the factory. But the chassis for this, of course, is, you know, um, silver color. The other one is kind of a goldish color. And the capacitors that came out of the other one were these uh, TRW uh, red ones, where these are the brown ones. That these look like they were. Um, oh, I think I, I have to see the actual model, but these look like they remind me of uh, Goodall, but I don't know till I pull them. So we've got one, two, three, four, five brown film capacitors. And then we got to deal with these electrolytics. That's going to be kind of interesting. Each one of these was a 40 microfarad 500 volt, and uh, two of them here are paralleled. Um, the other two are not. Um, so we shall figure out what to do with those. So those will be replaced with 47 microfarad 500 volt capacitors. I think we have a little more real estate in this area to kind of sneak things under here um, than we did in the scanning unit, so uh, hopefully this will be a little bit less uh, frustrating. Okay, so film capacitors are out, and the or the original fil film capacitors are out, and the replacements are in. So now we can move on to the electrolytics. I think I think I remember how I did this in the other unit. Um, these cans, by default, there's a spacer in there, so the can itself isn't actually grounded. They have them earthed with these wires. Um, so if I clip these wires out, I may very well have an open, uh, you know, solder point I can use so I don't have to reroute all of this jazz. But um, we'll get to work and get these swapped out. Okay, and with a little bit of creativity, we have one, two, three, four electrolytic capacitors to replace the large filter capacitors uh, they are 500 volts my replacements are 47 microfarad the original were 40 microfarad um, some of the original values like 40 and 50 microfarad are just not um, not made pretty much anymore um, so I'm gonna round off to whatever's the closest uh, you can if you really dig you can probably find them but I would rather um, you know buy fresh new stock then go get some old rusty crusty capacitors out of a TV guy's service bag that hasn't been opened since oh, probably uh, Jimmy Carter was president so this completes the recapping here we'll flip this over put this back on the tuning unit and put fresh tubes in it oh boy well we got our tubes in the socket 6SC7 is a new old stock tongue saw. 6SN7 is a Sovtec. The 6V6s are the uh, Shiguang Chinese. And our 5U4 rectifier is an Electroharmonics. Interestingly enough, with this, it didn't happen on the other side, which the other unit, the scanner unit, has different tube sockets and uh, a different colored chassis. I mean, like I say, I think they were built at a little different time. The tube sockets for these have a lot of grip, and the electroharmonics tube is probably the best at having the tips of the pins rounded off well. 
the tongue saw tube is fairly rounded off. The tube pins on these five are kind of flat and it took a good amount of wrestling to get them into the sockets. Um, and that's never good because wrestling with vacuum tubes, you know, is not good. You have to try to be careful with them and try to, you know, not break them. This is obviously a sealed glass ball. Uh, the plastic base is uh, slipped on and glued on. Um, so technically you can have the base detached and the tube would still work. But the, the pins on those, oh my goodness, they just really didn't want to go into those tube sockets. But uh, we've got our tuning fork plugged in. We've got our, our stuff here, so I figure with the lid off, we can kick the tires and light the fires now. Okay, so due to limited bench space, we have them separated here, but they are plugged together. And it's plugged into electricity. And so at this point, I suppose we can just flip the switch and see what happens. We've got it on warm up, which is the down position. Um, and there is our go for motor warm up. Right. Now over here on this side, the tuning fork should be getting going. I should actually feel it kind of humming and trying to get going. And that may have to do with... Uh... And then once that gets going, this light's going to come on. Come on, get going. Give it a little... There, it is, it is going, but it's not going too strong. And that is an adjustment on the side of the unit, so... Let me reach over and twist that a little bit. Let's see if that helps a bit. To get things going. That make it better or worse. Okay. Okay, so we are not quite there yet. See if we can get that light to kick on and run steady. Our tuning fork needs to go. So as soon as we get our tuning fork going, there it's going. I give it a little pluck to get it going. And the feedback from the Should be getting feedback from the SC7. We need to get that adjusted so that light stays on if we can. Okay, that certainly nuked it. Okay. So the fork is running. It's turned on. Up oh, there, it's weakening out a little bit. Let's see if we flip the little volt switch, if we can give it a little bit more volts and make it happier. Okay, I'm going to fiddle with this for a few minutes and then we'll come back. All right, so in that not wanting to remain oscillating, there's a feedback circuit that keeps it oscillating and it wasn't playing ball with me. So I came in here and we checked all the values of the various resistors and things that were out of tolerance were changed. Um, we had uh, two, four, five out of tolerance resistors here that were significantly out of tolerance. Um, so we've done that. Secondarily, while I was looking around, we had this resistor, which is on the 6SC7. Uh, that might have inadvertently gotten down and touched the low voltage for the uh, transformer, um, you know, the filament winding. And uh, if this got grounded out, um, that would cause an uh, inoperable state to... Uh, I, as you notice, any of these that I was concerned about touching anything, I actually jacketed them. I wish they would have jacketed a few more of these, but... Um, we're gonna go back together and we're gonna do some tests and see how we do. Okay kids, after we did our surgery, we're working. The only thing I wish I could do anything about, which I don't really think that I can, is the warm-up time. 
Um, when we flip this into warm up or motor warm up run, the circuit over here has to take the time to warm the tubes up and begin to produce enough signal to start driving the tuning fork. Um, this is going to depend on a lot of factors. Some tubes start emitting sooner than others. Uh, some, you know, uh, where the strength in the magnets here that do the driving, all of that kind of stuff. But when we take it off of, or when we have it on standby or motor warm up, we're waiting for this tuning fork to get going. And it should get going within a minute. But I have no patience. So sitting here talking to you on camera is making me crazy because I'm waiting for that orange light to come on. And so I figure if I don't look at it, maybe it will come on. Now I'm getting really frustrated. If I were to just tap on the tuning fork, then it would give itself a bit of a jump start, and it would actually come along sooner. Tapping on the unit to get a little bit of physical force in there so it can regenerate and get the oscillation going would probably be beneficial. But we waited, and I was about ready to throw my, throw my shoe at the wall. But in waiting, we built up enough energy in the tuning fork that we're now ready to run our Strobocon. This is normal operation. The owner's manual says up to a minute. You know, give it a minute or two to run. I want to do it in five seconds. You know, I've got, an, I've got a couple other ones of these. The one starts a little faster, but it has different tubes in it. Whatever. It started, it's going. Now when I flip it from, and of course these are labeled on the outside, when I sh from warm up to operate, you should hear the pitch of the motor slow, and the audio circuit will warm up. This light should not blink. If this light is blinking, it indicates there's not enough power coming from the unit over there. And it's not doing so whatsoever. Let's turn down the volume. We'll plug in our microphone. And as soon as we put on our microphone, we are getting the flashes. So now we just need to use a reference pitch to see where our A440 is. Okay, so I found that our meter was a couple of cents off. If you look at your tuning meter, obviously now it's top dead center. I'm playing a A440 reference pitch into the microphone and uh, it uh, was not holding still. I found that the tuning fork was out of calibration by about three cents, three cents to the sharp side, which would mean that the fork actually would be a little flat. And there are tuning slugs in the end of this fork there are these little machine screws right in the tips there and they can be adjusted to uh, to calibrate your fork this is the first one that I've actually ever had to calibrate the fork everything else has always come in pretty much guts on or really really close when you're doing a piano most of the time you'll bring your you'll bring your um, reference tuning fork that you know the people who own the piano want you to use or whatever and you'll ring that out and I've never found that either of my Strobocons were ever off more than a half a cent but we've got this one gut wrenches on and if we look at our scanner let's zoom in on the A I hope this shows up good on camera but you can see our middle A 
Oh yeah, that does show up, kinda. It looks, you can see that the pattern there has essentially stopped. Now if we were sharp, if we were sharp it would be going that direction. If we were flat, it would be going that direction. But when I put the needle at zero, it stops. And that is what we're looking for. Right there. Beautiful. So now I have a lot of screws to put in here. I have to replace the missing screws. We need to oil it. Um, yay. But the mission of figuring out what the world is wrong with the circuitry and getting that going uh, has been solved. Uh, this particular Strobocon takes a little longer to warm up than I wanted to. It may very well just be our selection of tubes. It seems to take about 30 to 40 seconds. Again, according to the manual, that's normal. Um, you know, but once we get her driving the wheels, it's driving the wheels. And we'll run this for a few hours and make sure everything's happy. Um, you know, this is proper operation. It's just, I wish it warmed up faster. Why don't you warm up faster? And it's probably just comes down to the tubes in there and how quickly they begin to emit at full gusto. I mean, if you're doing an audio circuit, you're supposed to turn on your tube amp and wait a minute or two before you play your music. Well, same thing here. But I don't have any patience. Okay, so before we put lids on things, I'll actually let this run on warm-up just for fun while we do this. I have the official Strombocon gearbox lubricant. It's a very, very, very thin oil. I mean very, very thin. Um, finding it is going to probably be really, really tough, so I would suggest like a sewing machine oil or a Hammond oil organ, or Hammond organ oil. Very, very thin. And then your motor lubricant really isn't anything magic to my knowledge. Should be very similar to 3-in-1's electric motor lubricant. The cork right here is the one you use to open the gearbox. You take the cork out, and then we'll put about six drops-ish in here. Not too much, just a little bit. There we go. And actually, I'm under a fairly good impression that this unit has been oiled regularly. Uh, there was some residue all over the place that I cleaned up, so I don't think it's because the gearbox is leaking. They seal those pretty darn well, but uh, obviously the gearbox is running at a normal volume. You might still hear my A440 reference pitch singing out down there. It's kind of funny that it's doing that. And then motor lubricant goes here and back here. So, a few drops each place, and we'll be good. Oh goodness, why did you guys have to put the flapper in this direction? Would have been so much more convenient had you faced the flapper towards me. User. And there you go. So now our motor is lubricated. And we should be able to reassemble our Strobocon. Okay. So, anyway... This uh, tuning unit was really kind of slow starting. And um, so I had a phone conversation and we talked about it and we were reading the schematic. And apparently the older version of the tuner unit that used six V6s um, had more drive uh, on the plate of the 6SC7. Let me grab you a schematic and I'll show you what we're talking about. The Let's just whack the camera around a lot. Okay, here is our 6SC7. And my camera says I'm on low battery. Lucky me. 
Okay, so the plate of the 6SC7 has this 390K resistor that I've circled. Um, the older version of this had a 100K, which would provide significantly more gain and more drive to the coils. Um, what I did on this one is I paralleled another 100, or excuse me, another 390K to give us approximately 190, I think it measures at about 196K. So there's still plenty of resistance and the voltages are still well within the spec of the tube. But it increases the gain of the, gain of the tube and it is allowing the coil to get started in a reasonable amount of time. Now I'm going to put this back together for real. Okay, so with our very slight resistance mod, the warm-up time is about 20 to 25 seconds. We physically had to adjust the slugs in the tuning fork, and we have a beautiful lock on an A440. Um, other than running here for a little while, just to make sure it doesn't do anything stupid after running for like an hour, I guess the only thing left to do is to tune something with it. So, I'll go get a guitar. Okay, so, let's zoom in a little bit more on our StrobelCon screen. We have a guitar here that is not in tune at all. And we've already checked our StrobelCon for its A440 reference pitch. I haven't shut it off since. So, we're on the C scale. Our first high and low note is E. So we'll start at our E, which is actually all the way down at a D. So we're going to roll it up until the D, until it appears that the E has stopped rolling. Now instead of just pinpointing it in picture perfect, which it already is, um, I'm going to go to another string now and reel that in because the neck of the guitar is going to move. Try B, which is going to be on the far right, far right corner. And then we'll move to the G, which is right there. This guitar was tuned down a whole, whole step probably for the purpose of storage. I store my guitars because of weather changes. I don't take the strings off, but I because that's not smart either, because you have a truss rod in there. But I do relax them a bit. There's D, which was this one. And A, which A is right next to B down there on the bottom row. Sometimes it helps if I twiddle with my EQ on the guitar. And let's go back to the low E here. It needs to go up. That looks good. A. D. G. This device is so sensitive. What's funny is you can actually hear the sounds coming out of the circuitry up there with the neon bulb flasher and everything. You can actually hear your notes sort of pulse in the circuitry. Okay, now according to our Strobocon, the guitar is in tune. I'm going to turn it down so I don't 
shock it full of tons of signal because that would just be rude. say that worked pretty well to get our guitar in tune. And let's see if our guitar actually stayed in tune because like I say when you freshly tune these things up man they love to walk. Just a touch flat on that string, touch flat over there, just tuned it up of course that one's still good. sensitivity just a little bit to see it good. Yep, now we're good, so. It's working good. Everything's fine. I'm going to let it run for another hour or so. Um, this was an adventure. I pretty much worked on it for the lion's share of Saturday. We have all new tubes, all new capacitors, a lot of replacement screws from those that were missing, a fabricated slider for the transposition scale, uh, a fabricated power cord because the one that was on there was like some kettle lead that was held together by duct tape. Um, out of tolerance resistors in the tuner unit. Uh, just a lot, a lot, a lot of time, a lot of effort. Um, but you know what? Where else are you going to get one of these? It's not like they grow on trees. And they're very cool, they're extremely accurate and they're very handy to have, so now we got it working. And uh, quite frankly, there were a few parts of this process that really, really had me frustrated, and so for support. Um, he's a viewer to this channel. He goes by Glass Monster. Uh, he lives in Canada. Thank you very much, my friend, for discussing the mysterious Strobocon, the 6T question mark, because I don't know what it is according to the nameplate, and the bottom unit says Elkhart, Indiana, like all of the other con stuff I have, but the top one says Oak Brook, Illinois, so I don't know if these two even were born together, put together, whatever, but now they're working together, so hooray for everything. Have a great day.